there are three that you need to know. The first one is the molecular equation. And the molecular equation is what we have been always writing. It represents all species as molecules, even if you put on your Miss Frizzle glasses and could look, that's not how they really exist. So the molecular equation gives the overall stoichiometry. It shows all your reactants and products combined, even if they're soluble. Um, it's what we've always written. And of course, it's always balanced. So we call this equation here between um, potassium chromate and barium nitrate, this would be the complete molecular equation. Everybody's together, it's balanced, everything's all good. It's what we've always done. Now, what we can do then is put on Miss Frizzle glasses. Okay, so in going from our molecular equation to our complete ionic equation, we think about, well, if I could look at this potassium chromate with my Miss Frizzle glasses, would it be together or would it be apart? And the way you tell if it's together or apart is you use your solubility rules. Things that will exist dissociated, things that will be apart, are soluble ionic compounds. So remember, all group ones are soluble, all nitrates are soluble, all perchlorates are soluble, all acetates are soluble, right? Strong acids and strong bases. So you would represent any reactants and any products that are strong acids, strong bases, or soluble ionic compounds as ions, which means you would break them apart, you would include proper charges, okay? So in going from here to here, really all that you do is put on your Miss Frizzle glasses. You break things apart. You break apart the strong six acids. So that means you have to remember those. The strong bases and the soluble ionic compounds. What do you keep together? Whoops. You don't break apart. Maybe we'll make a note here. Anything covalent other than a strong acid. Anything solid, anything gaseous, and weak acids and bases. Okay? So remember, it, it, what this requires in going from here to here is you know who your strong bases are. Group 1 with OH and the bottom 4 in group 2 with OH. And it also requires that you know who your strong acids are. Okay, so again, they're in your notes in this chapter, but they're HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. Those are your strong acids. That's, if it's one of those acids, you break it apart. If it's any other acid, you keep it together. Okay? Unless it's a solid, then you don't break it apart. Okay, so it has to say aqueous after it to break it apart. Okay, so if you're breaking apart, it really has to say aqueous. If it doesn't say aqueous, don't break it apart. Or a lot of times you're writing these from words anyway. Okay, not from actual equations. Remember your strong bases are group one with OH and the bottom four of group two with OH. Everybody else you keep together. So when you break that apart, make sure, since you're breaking them into ions, they must have proper charges. Oh, another case where if you don't know your charges, you're kind of in trouble, right? That's why memorizing that stuff is so important. So if you break apart potassium chromate, you get two K pluses, Right, K is plus one, and chromate, that's minus two. Yes, Robbie? Would, would it ever happen that it's um, with a metal, it has like more than one charge, like iron or something? Yep, yep, it would. Well, so say they had like this, Robbie, FeNO33, right? You should know what iron's charge will be in that compound because you know nitrate is minus one. So iron, if it takes three nitrates to make this compound neutral, that would break apart into iron three, right? And then you'd have three nitrates. 
Remember with these, these wife swapping, double replacement reactions, charges never change. So whatever iron is on this side, then it would be on the other side as well. Not that it necessarily would be broken apart on both sides. Okay, that's some, I don't want you to think that. But whatever the charge is over here, that would also be the charge it has on the right. Yes, Andrew. When, when we're writing it, should we write if it's aqueous, or solid? Yeah, because that will help you think about whether, how you break it apart. So yeah, you should include the phases. If you have time, <laughs> include the phases. So the complete ionic represents what the beakers look like before and after the reaction if you could wear your Miss Frizzle glasses, okay? You keep together anything covalent, anything insoluble, and any weak or uh, weak acid or weak base. So if you notice, let's just look at this complete ionic equation here. If you notice, anything with group one is soluble, right? All group ones are soluble, so we broke that apart, right? K plus, two K pluses, and CrO4 minus two. All nitrates are soluble, so we broke that apart. Ba plus two, and two NO3 minuses. Barium chromate is insoluble. That is not a rule I would say you should memorize, but you do have the solubility rules right in your notes. So you would look up chromates. Chromates are mostly insoluble, unless we combined with group one or ammonium. So this is insoluble, plus it says solid here. That's your hint. Keep it together. But again, you won't always have those hints because sometimes it's words and you have to write the phases in. That's why, that's why when you ask that question, I always recommend you write the phases in. And then again, any group one or nitrate is soluble, so we broke that apart, okay? Now real quick, in going from here to here, the big difference is we got rid of the spectators. The spectators are the things that are just watching the reaction happen that are not participating in it. Kind of like someone at a sporting event that is a spectator. They are watching the sporting event. They are not really participating in it. So guess what we do? We remove them from the equation because they're not important. Now I know the 12th man and all that, right? But here they're not important. They're not cheering on the, the ions going, yay, make a precipitate. They're not important. It doesn't matter. So if you notice, do you see 2K plus here? And do you see 2K plus here? It's the exact same ion before the arrow as it is after the arrow. So it is a spectator. This is a spectator ion. So guess what we're going to do? Remove it. Are there any other spectator ions? NO3 is a spectator. Very good. Right here and right here. And so we remove them from the equation. And when you remove the spectators from the equation, you no longer have the complete ionic equation. You've removed the unimportant things. You have the net ionic equation, which includes only the components that underwent a change. We have removed the spectator ions. And maybe let's just make a note, and then we'll take our roll call break, that spectator ions are the ions that are the same before and after the arrow. you can have H plus as a spectator ion, so you, it, yeah, yes, I mean if it's insoluble it can't be a spectator ion. So yes, it will only be components that are soluble. But it doesn't always mean that there are two, there can be different numbers of these. Sometimes we always want to get rid of two and just think this ion plus this ion makes that solid. It's not always that way. There are many different varieties of this. Okay? So the spectator ions are not participating, <laughs> they're not precipitating either, uh, in the reaction. Okay? They're the same before as they are after. So we have three different equations, complete molecular, complete ionic, net ionic. And we'll walk through examples of how we do these after we come back from roll call break. Take a break, guys. I'll do a couple of these with you and we'll do some practice. Uh, what they want you to do is write molecular, complete ionic, and net ionic equation. And even when they only ask you for net ionic equation, I recommend you walk through these in depth. Because it's easier to get to the net ionic equation if you write the complete molecular, then the complete ionic, and then the net ionic equation. Okay? So this is how it normally looks. Aqueous potassium chloride is added to silver nitrate. So the first thing that we obviously need to do is get the proper formulas, which means you need 
The symbols, the charges, crisscross if they don't equal zero. So Rebecca, what's the symbol for potassium? Okay. And chloride? CL. And what are the charges? Um, I don't know. K is positive one. Yep. And CL is negative one. Correct. So those equal zero. So that's the formula for potassium chloride. Once you get the formula, erase the charges. You don't want to leave the charges in, okay? Because then it would kind of seem like you broke them down to the ions. It's aqueous, so we'll add the AQ, okay? Now we're adding that to silver nitrate. What is the formula, at least, for silver nitrate? Good. AG is silver. Nitrate is NO3. Um, AgNO3. Ag is plus one. Nitrate is minus one. That is the formula for AgNO3. And I really think there was supposed to be the word aqueous there. This isn't solid silver nitrate. We'll assume that that's aqueous. That's my mistake. Whenever two solutions are mixed, if you remember from section four or five, a wife swapping double replacement reaction occurs. So the K and the Ag will swap partners, right? And if you remember, the potassium was plus one, the chloride was minus one, the silver is plus one, and the nitrate is minus one. Sometimes it's useful to write the charges there. Because now when the potassium gets together with the nitrate, you know plus one, minus one, you really don't have to think about it again. Okay? Since all group ones are soluble, we know this has to be aqueous because it has a group one uh, uh, element in it. Okay? And then um, the silver is now with the chloride. And hopefully from the zip drive that you watched, you remember that silver chloride is one of the insoluble chlorides. Most chlorides are soluble, but silver, mercury, and lead are not. Again, if you didn't watch the zip drive, you have the solubility rules on a page that looks like this in your notes. Okay, So you can just look up the chlorides. So this is insoluble, so it would be a solid. Okay? The equation is balanced, so we don't need to worry about balancing it, okay? That is our molecular equation. I'm just going to abbreviate it ME, molecular equation. Now we'll put on our Miss Frizzle glasses, and we'll break apart anybody that's soluble, any strong acid, or any strong base, okay? So we already know that any group 1 compounds are soluble, so this will exist as potassium ions and chloride ions. And if you want to write AQ, you can. I kind of don't, but... On the AP exam, if you do not include the phases, that's okay. All nitrates are soluble, so this is not existing together. It's existing dissociated as silver ions and nitrate ions. And now we move on to our products. What do you think about kalium potassium nitrate there? Keep it together or break it apart? Break it apart. Right. Why? Oh, go ahead. All, any compound that has a group one element is always soluble. Always. And so are nitrates. So that's why we would break them apart, because it's soluble. K plus and NO3 minus. Some of these car alarms going off. And how about the silver chloride? What do you think about that one, Aslan? Keep it together. Why? Because it's... Uh Soluble. Yep, it's a solid, and we already dealt with that solubility rule. Keep it together. Okay? Complete ionic equation. Now let's identify the spectator ions. Andrew, who are the spectator ions? K plus is a spectator ion. I'm just going to put a box around it. And then NO3 minus is a spectator ion. So when we go from the complete ionic equation, which has everybody in it, to the net ionic equation, we remove those spectator ions. The spectator ions are in the box up there. So what that leaves us then for our net ionic equation, the business, what's actually happening in this reaction, is silver ions are combining, chloride ions are combining with silver ions to make solid silver chloride. Everybody else is just hanging out in the container watching. Okay? That's what you do. That's how you go from molecular to complete ionic to net ionic equation. Why don't you please try one now? Okay, so I'll pause this. We'll 
So Erin put her complete molecular equation up here on the board, and she's absolutely perfect. So we'll just label this complete molecular equation. And now we'll have, oh, I don't know, diamond? Why don't you come on up and do your complete ionic equation? We'll pause this so we're not wasting. Okay, so a couple corrections, just a couple, okay? Um, first of all, when you break these apart, you break them down into what? No, ions. And what do ions always have? So you have to include the charges when you break them apart. Okay, so K should be plus one. OH should be minus one. FE should be plus three, right? And then um, this, you know how you have three nitrates to make the neutral compound? That becomes the coefficient. Three NO3 minuses, okay? K plus one, NO3 minus one. And be careful, you included the parentheses up here, but not down here. So make sure you include those parentheses. The other thing is, what happened to the three Ks here? Right, this has to get distributed to these. So you have three K pluses and three OH minuses. So make sure you include the charges and make sure the coefficient of the compound becomes the coefficient of the ions and make sure the number of polyatomics you have becomes the coefficient for the polyatomic. Okay? But solubilities are applied beautifully. Hydroxides are generally insoluble unless you're group one or the bottom four and group two. So this should stay together because this is your solid. This is insoluble. It's a weak base. That's why we keep this together. It's not one of our strong bases. Remember, bases are metals with OH, right? Or proton acceptors, which we'll talk about later. But metals with OH are weak bases. So that is your net ionic equation. Any issues with that? So when we go from the net ionic uh, sorry, that is your, yeah, you should have asked a question. That's your complete ionic equation. And when we go from the complete ionic equation to the net ionic equation, what do we have to do, Alexis? And who are the spectators here? Why don't you come, why don't you come underline the spectators and write the net ionic equation, please? Or box them, whatever you prefer to do. We didn't distribute that K there. Will you distribute that, that three, I mean? Again, <laughs> weren't they the spectators in the last reaction we did as well? Okay, I had neglected to distribute this three, oopsie, this three here. So make sure you distribute that coefficient as well. And then we remove the spectators from solution and we have hydroxide plus iron three goes to make iron three hydroxide. Questions on that? Molecular, complete ionic, net ionic. Any problems? You understand the difference between the net ionic and the complete ionic? You understand the difference between the complete ionic and the molecular? I'm assuming no questions means we're good. Okay, so of course we can do calculations with these. And they're no different than any other calculation. They're absolutely no different, okay? Except now we're having molarity as a way to find moles. So. We write and balance the equation, we plug in what we know, we get moles of the known, we convert it to moles of the unknown, and then we solve for what they ask, right? That same process we walked through in chapter three. Again, another reason why chapter three laid the foundation for the rest. So we'll just walk through a couple of these. I think I have two here, and then um, we'll break and um, talk about your homework for tonight. So number one, calculate the mass of solid NaCl that must be added to 1.5 liters of a 1 molar, 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution to precipitate all of the silver ions in the form of silver chloride. Which sounds crazy, 
But you ask, you have to ask yourself, what the heck is happening? Who is reacting here? Who am I mixing? Who's mixing together in this reaction? Anybody know who we're mixing together? Perfect. NaCl solid and AgNO3 solution, right? That's who we're mixing. You're putting salt in a solution of silver nitrate. Right? That's what you're doing. To, so really the salt's going to dissolve, right? And they're going to undergo what kind of reaction? Double replacement. Two ionic compounds always undergo double replacement. So we're going to make silver chloride, which we already know is insoluble from the last problem we did, and sodium nitrate, which is aqueous. Okay? And it's valent. And I did it in my head, I didn't say it out loud, but Na's plus one, no 3 is minus one, Ag is plus one, Cl is minus one. I did check the charges and make sure I made a neutral compound. Then I write the given information underneath my thing. So remember step one when we did equations in chapter three was to write and balance the equation? And then I put the given in information under what was given. So we're given 1.50 liters of this and 0.1 molar. And they want to know, calculate the mass. Calculate the grams of this. Now what about all that other stuff? To precipitate all of the silver ions in the form of silver nitrate. Well, they're really, it's irrelevant to the question, sort of. If you could put on your Miss Frizzle glasses, right, this would really be existing as silver ions and nitrate ions because all nitrates are soluble. And so in mixing the salt to the silver nitrate, the silver ions are going to bond with the chloride ions and precipitate a silver chloride. Okay? So it's really just explaining the reaction that's happening. It really doesn't have anything to do necessarily with how you do the problem. So they want to know how many grams of this are needed to react with all of that. That's what they don't want any excess silver ions floating around in solution, right? So how many grams of this are need to precipitate all the silver ions? How come they didn't say how many grams of this are needed to precipitate all of the nitrate ions? Robbie? Nitrate doesn't precipitate. Right. Nitrate is soluble. It stays, it's soluble here and it's soluble here. So the sodium ions and the nitrate ions are going to remain soluble. So really we're precipitating, we're turning into a solid, the uh, silver ions. Okay? So what can you get with what you're given? Yes, Kayla? Yep. So once we write in the balance equation, we write down what's given and what's asked, we find the moles of the given, right? And that's all in those steps that are on the previous page that you have, or actually right above. So we're going to find the moles of AgNO3. Because the moles of silver nitrate are equal to the molarity times the volume in liters, right? I just rearranged the molarity formula here. Molarity equals moles over liters. We have molarity. <laughs> we have liters. So the molarity is 0.1. The volume in liters is 1.5. going to give me 0.15 moles. What do you do next when they give you information about one thing in the reaction and ask you about another? Mole, mole. Mole, mole between them, right? Mole, mole between your given and asked. I do it all in one dimensional analysis, but the next step is to do a mole mole between your given and your asked. Your given is the AgNO3, your asked is the NaCl, right? So we're going to do a mole mole between the AgNO3 and the NaCl. Now, where we get the information for the mole mole is in the balanced equation. According to the balanced equation, <laughs> God bless you. For every one, God bless you. For every one mole of silver nitrate that reacts, I will need, that's a one, even though it doesn't look like it, one mole of sodium chloride. So that would give me 0.15 moles of the NaCl. 
All right, now I know how many moles of NaCl I need to add, but they didn't want moles, they wanted grams, because I don't have a scale that weighs moles. So what should I do? Convert the, the asked to grams, right? Convert the moles of what's asked to grams. And actually, you would convert it to whatever they asked you, whatever unit they wanted. But in this case, they wanted grams. So I'm going to take the 0.15 moles. And again, I would do this. I'm breaking it down for you so that you can look at this later and follow these steps. One mole of NaCl is what, 58.44? Thank you. 5844 grams. So 0.15 uh, times 58.44. It's 8.766. And let's look at sig figs back up in the question. Looks like 3, right? So 8.77. are mixed, lead sulfate precipitates. They don't even have to tell you that. You should know that based on the solubility rules. Calculate the mass of lead sulfate formed when 1.25 liters and 0.05 molar lead nitrate and 2 liters of 0.025 molar sodium sulfate are mixed. Should be the last two words of that question. Right? Oh, yeah, I've got it up here. You don't have it on here. Are mixed. All right, what should I do first, Alexis? Okay, who's reacting? Na2SO4 and PbNO32. William, what will we make? We're going to make a PbSO4 and NaNO3. Uh, Perfect. We're going to make PbSO4 because this must be lead 2, right? Oh, oops, sorry. Up here, lead 2. And so it's got to be lead 2 here. Sulfate's minus 1. And we're making Na, which is plus 1, with the NO3, which is minus 1. Okay? We know that these are solutions. Group 1s are soluble. Nitrates are soluble. We know that this is a precipitate, so that's a solid. How do I know that? Because they said PbSO4 precipitates, so it's a solid. And we know all nitrates are soluble, so that's aqueous. Alexa said we needed to write and balance the equation. So, Aslan, how do I balance this? You put a 2 by the NaO3. NA Perfect. You put a 2 over here. What's next, Becca? Um, we have to uh, write down what's given. Perfect. Okay. So, we're given 1.25 liters of 0 0.05 molar that. And we're given 2 liters of 0 0.025 molar that. Do you guys hear it? Yeah? What do you hear? Very good, Diamond. There are bells and whistles going off. We are given amounts of two reactants. So this is a limiting reagent problem, right? Just building on from Chapter 3, this is a limiting reagent problem. We need to figure out who runs out first, right? Oh, what do they want to know? We wrote down the given information. What the heck do they want? Calculate the mass of PbSO4. All right. Well, we got to figure out who runs out first to calculate the mass. So what should I do, Sid? Get them to moles. Good. How do I get them to moles, Sid? Right, so the mol we're going to use the molarity formula and just rearrange and solve for moles. Moles equal molarity, 0 0.025, times liters, which is 2. And what do we get there, Sid? 0 0.05? Yeah. And that's the moles of Na2SO4 that we have. 
And I do the same thing for the lead nitrate, right? Our moles equal our molarity, 0 0.05, times our liters, 1.25. And what do we get there, Sid? 0.0625. What's next, Robbie? Yeah, do a mole mole between uh, two reactants in each Do a mole mole between two reactants to figure out how much of one you need to react with all of the other. So the next step is to do a mole mole between your reactants. So I'll start with the uh, silver, um, what is that? Sodium sulfate. 0 0.05 moles of Na2SO4. According to the equation that is balanced, are they one to one? Ah, I love it. It's nice when they're one to one, right? Fantastic. For every one mole of sodium sulfate, we will need one mole of lead nitrate. And if you remember, when the they're, they have the same coefficient, the whoever there's less of will run out first, right? So I know I'm going to need 0 0.05 moles of lead nitrate. But I have 0 0.0625, so I have plenty, right? I have enough lead nitrate. I have more than I need. So that means this guy is your limiting reagent, right? The sodium sulfate. Again, when, they have the, when the reactants have the same coefficient, Whoever there is less moles of, I had 0.05 moles of this and 0.0625 moles of this. Whoever there is less moles of runs out first. So this is your limiting reagent, okay? That's your limiting reagent. Now what? What do I do next, Rebecca? I know who's limited, great. is that this guy is going to determine how much product we make. This one's unimportant, okay? That's an excess. That's what we've just determined. So we know the moles of it we have. We can find the moles of product that we'll make by doing a mole-mole between them. So once you know who is limiting, you do another mole-mole, this time between your limiting reagent and your product. Okay, you were trying to do empirical formula determination. Okay, okay? so we have 0 0.05 moles of the Na2SO4. Again, they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's just beautiful, right? For every one mole of the Na2SO4, you will produce one mole of PdSO4. They're in a one-to-one -one ratio, so we know we're going to make 0.05 moles of the PBSO4. But I don't feel like doing this in another step. So what do I do next, Robbie, to get mass? Um, you do 12.5 times the formula mass, which is um, 303.26. So once I have the moles of PBSO4 that I will make, I then convert it to grams, right? I, I did this all in one step. So I should make um, 0 0.05 times that number. Do you have the answer? Yeah, it's 15.2. So I should make, my theoretical yield of PBSO4 is 15.2 grams. Did Robbie do sig figs right? Yeah, three. He did. Just checking. Don't be defensive. Wasn't sure. Okay? So do you see it's the same stuff from chapter three? It's just now with solutions. It's exact, it's limiting reagent. It's theoretically good. It's all the same stuff. Which might be good for you or might not. I think for those of us that were confused in chapter three, seeing it again will help us. Seeing it again will help us clear up some of that confusion. Issues with that? Questions? Homework? How about, uh, we already did 36. 
So I think we're doing homework number three. We've already done question 36, so there's no need to do that again. Uh, let me just look and make sure I want you to do all of them. Already. Okay? Questions? You guys can get started now. You have about, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. 